Okay, so we got down to the end of the discussion or the or the end of the legislative process down here, and we said at a minimum there is a total of how many of these? Thirteen. Thirteen, Thirteen. Points, at a minimum. The at, the exact number is really not important. Okay, so if you saw on a quiz, for example, around a dozen, that's sufficient. Okay. I mean, you might see on a quiz next week, the number 13. But if you saw, if answer A was 145, you know, if the question says, at a minimum, there are this many veto points, blank veto points, and answer A was 142, and answer B was 597, and you know, whatever else, and you know, answer E is 13, then you would pick 13, right? Or if it said, around a dozen you would pick around a dozen okay don't get so hung up on the number okay but just kind of we want to know kind of in general what we're talking about here now that's at a minimum when we start adding in potentially um riders as they're called non-germane amendments that might be added in the senate right I'm not sure if we used the term riders last time. I think we were using the term non-germane amendments, but it's the same thing. I think probably the authors of the textbook used the term riders, okay? Sometimes they're called riders or non-germane amendments. You add some, those might be added in. Um, you might have an appropriations measure. You might have a tax measure attached to it. You start adding in all these other veto points, and we're talking somewhere on a typical bill, dozens. You know, maybe, and again, I'm just ballparking it here, the exact number's not that critical, but maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 50, 60, 70 veto points on a typical bill. So when we think about that, we really do sort of begin to appreciate this idea that, well, it really is difficult for Congress to pass legislation. And it makes it very difficult for Congress to be an institution that we can think of as unified and integrated that can identify problems of a national scope, develop a legislative program in response to those problems, enact it into law, and then oversee its implementation. It's very, very difficult for Congress to do that legislative function given that fragmentation of power. Okay, But where we left last time, we said, well, and we didn't have time really to go through all of the conditions that support fragmentation of power in Congress. I focused on the idea of the representation function and the constituency focus that you have with the representation function and on the veto points, particularly centered around the committee system. That's what I focused on. But, you know, some of these other scholars who have spent their entire academic career study in Congress, they'll identify other things that support that fragmentation of power in Congress, right? So we didn't have a chance to develop that fully. It's enough, I think, for our purposes in an introductory course to just try to get a sense of this notion of fragmentation of power in Congress, right? But we left off, you know, where we left it last time, we said, well, but there are certain conditions they're not as commonly found or not as, as uh, easily identified in Congress most of the time. But when they're present, they can push towards greater integration, Congress acting more as a unified body, increasing its likelihood of identifying problems of a national scope and uh, developing a legislative program in response to those problems and enacting that into law and overseeing the implementation of that legislation and the only one really that we talked about there was the unifying presence of political parties so we made the distinction between divided government of which we said there are two forms right just ring a bell right divided government there are two forms the first form being when you have a president of one party and then both chambers in congress the other, the opposition party has a majority of seats in both chambers, House of Representatives and the Senate, right? And that's the form of government that we found, for example, in the last two years of the Obama administration. President Obama was a Democrat, and you had the Republicans having majorities, slim majorities in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, okay? The, the point being that if you have that form of divided government, 
we probably shouldn't expect a very legis a very ambitious legislative program. It's going to be very difficult for you know Congress to enact an ambitious legislative program in response to national problems. You're probably not going to get an immigration reform bill, right, or whatever the problem of the day is, right? You might get one, but if you do, the president might veto it. And actually, during those two years of the Obama administration, even when you had Republican majorities in the House of Representatives and the Senate, you still couldn't get, you still couldn't overcome bicameralism because the House and the Senate, even though both had Republican majorities, they couldn't come up with a compromise, ver compromise version of immigration reform. So that's one of the points about divided government. The first form of divided government, where you have a president of one party and then the other party has a majority of seats in both the House and the Senate. But the second form of divided government, some political scientists argue, is even more problematic. That's when, regardless of the party of the president, you have one party with a majority in the House of Representatives and another party with a majority in the Senate. And their research seems to tell us that that makes the chances of some sort of ambitious legislative program ever passing uh, almost is negligible, virtually non-existent, that you're going to get anything of consequence. Okay? But there are those rare times, divided government is really the rule in the American system, okay? but there are the exceptions to the rules always, right? With any general rule, there's always exceptions, right? So if the rule is that usually we have divided government, one of those two forms of divided government, then the exception must be that, okay, there must be periods where we've had unified party government, where you've had a president in both chambers of Congress, the same party, right? Now, one of those periods, the first form of unified party government is when you have a president, you know, of one party, and then the same party has slim majorities in the House and the Senate. And I gave you an example of that. The, the example of that that I gave you was back in 2010 when Barack Obama was president and the Democrats had slim majorities in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, and you got the Affordable Care Act, right? That wouldn't have been possible if you'd had divided government. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not advocating either for or against the Affordable Care Act, whether you perceive it as being good legislation or bad legislation. The point is that many people recognize it as a, as a significant legislative accomplishment. In fact, at the time, President Obama said it was the greatest legislative accomplishment since the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And I thought at the time, oh, come on, give me a break. <laughs> Mr. Obama, you know, I'm not suggesting that the Affordable Care Act wasn't important, but to put it up there with the 1964 Civil Rights Act is oh, maybe self-aggrandizing, you know. Anyway, um, so you could get the Affordable Care Act in 2010 because you had unified party government, the first form of unified party government. What is that? When you have a president, whatever party the president is, and then the same party has a majority in both chambers, but they're slight majorities. I think the Democrats have like 56%, 55% seat majorities in the House and the Senate. Let me find, see if I can find this here real quick. Where is it? So like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, and, and we can get to that here in just a second. Let me, let me point this out here real quick. See, here we have in the 111th Congress, you have the Democrats with 57% of the seats in the Senate and just under 59% of the seats in the House of Representatives. And I'm, I'm just suggesting to you that that is a slim to moderate majority, and it makes something like the Affordable Care Act possible when you wouldn't have gotten it. You would not have gotten it in the 109th Congress, or you wouldn't have gotten it here in the 113th Congress because you had divided government. Okay. Then the second form of divided government, and this is the point that we left off on last time, we've only had a couple of, two or three periods in our history where we've had this occur, where you have these 
significant majorities. The same party with significant majorities in both the House and the Senate. And we're going to have an opportunity to talk when we get to our topic. It's not too far. We don't have many weeks left in the semester, but I can't remember if it's in week 13 or week 14, but one of those weeks we're going to be talking about civil rights. And we're going to talk in detail about some of that civil rights legislation that was passed in the 10 years following the Civil War. I think some of you are probably going to be surprised by how progressive some of that legislation was. Um, I'm suggesting to you it was only possible because you had these significant Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate. <clears throat> and then the second period occurs during the New Deal, right? When you have the Democratic president, Franklin Roosevelt, and these huge Democratic majorities, three quarters, two thirds, three quarters majorities, Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate. And you get that very le ambitious legislative program called the New Deal, right? And then in the 1960s, um, here, these, this is during the Kennedy years. And so you got what was called the new, his legislative program is called the New Frontier, okay? But particularly we see it when Lyndon Johnson is president. And you get all that great society legislation that was passed by these large democratic majorities and the coalition that you know enabled that was pretty interesting because you know it included not only liberal democrats but also um, southern conservative democrats some people might suggest that you know the reagan period is another period we had this significant legislative program I, I'm not one of those people. I, I don't mean to underplay the importance of the Reagan presidency. I just, I, you know, during the Reagan years, you had divided government. For, for most of the Reagan years, you had divided government. And it was only because, you know, that any part of his legislative program got passed was only because Southern conservative Democrats, you know, sort of crossed over and voted with Republicans. And most of those people have subsequently become Republicans. <laughs> so... He was like a Republican majority. Okay, anyway, so I just wanted to hammer that point home because I wasn't, we were rushing through that last time at the end of the class period and I wasn't sure that I was able to, to make that point very emphatically. One of, the, one of the conditions that may minimize fragmentation of power in Congress or promote greater integration in Congress, greater unity in Congress, fewer decision-making centers, more decision-making power in the hands of party leaders, for example, it is unified party government. Now, you pointed out, Everett, that we're currently in a period where um, we have a Democratic president and then Democrats have a majority in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. So we can say, okay, we're in a period of unified party government. But which form of unified party government is it? It's the first form of unified party government where you have slim majorities. The Democrats literally have a tie-breaking vote in the Senate. Right? It's a 50-50 split between the, here, let me get the, uh, where is it? There it is. All right? The Democrats have, actually, the Democrats only have 48 seats in the House of Representatives. This says 46, but that's wrong. It should say 48, okay? And the Republicans have 50. I was in the process of updating this and I didn't get this far. This should, so if you're, if you're taking notes on this, just know that in the 107th Congress, currently there are 50 Republicans and there are 48 Democrats and there are two independents, Bernie Sanders from Vermont and Angus King from Maine. But they caucus with the Democrats. So that makes it a 50-50 split. And then if there's a tie, of course, the vice president is the presiding officer, casts the tie-breaking vote. So the Democrats, by virtue of the fact that Kamala Harris is a Democrat, have the majority. Okay? But it's a very slim majority. And all you need, and we've already seen this in the first few months of the Biden presidency, right? If one Democratic senator, like, say, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, says, I'm not on board 
Remember that economic stimulus package that they originally put together? They wanted to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And Joe Manchin said, forget it. I'm not, he's a Democrat. I'm not supporting that. And so that just comes out, right? And other Democratic senators on other issues have already indicated that they're not on board with, you know, the Democratic proposal. So that's going to be a problem for the Democrats over the next two years, having a, having a very slim majority in the Senate. And it's going to diminish the ability to well, the Biden ad administration to push a very aggressive legislative agenda. And the majority is not much bigger in the these Again, these numbers are not correct. This is from the 116th Congress. I haven't had a chance to update it. I think the Democrats have about an 11 seat mar uh, uh, majority. It's really very close in the House of Representatives too. So that's a, that's a problem for the Democrats. So you might expect to see some movement you know, certainly movement away from Trump era policies, but whether you're going to get some sort of progressive, you know, ambitious progressive agenda, like maybe some Democrats so far, seems unlikely because the majorities just aren't there. Okay, questions, comments about any of that? As I said, I just, I really wanted to just hammer that point home because I think it is um, important for us to understand that we really, it's, this doesn't happen very often in American history. As I say, maybe three times we've had that. The, uh, again, just, just to repeat it, during the Reconstruction period, immediately the decade following the Civil War, during the Great Depression New Deal era, and then during the 1960s Great Society program. Okay, let's uh, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about the presidency. Obviously, we've said a few things about the presidency in our discussion of Congress, but let's turn our attention systematically to the presidency. I want to begin by sharing some data with you. Let me close this up real quick. Everybody collapses. Okay. So you look, you're looking at a time series graph up here showing initially the blue line shows presidential approval ratings going back more than a half century from the Eisenhower presidency to the current Biden presidency. And this is Gallup poll data. Every month the Gallup poll asks people a sample of Americans do you approve? Very simple, very simple question. I like the Gallup poll for one reason. I like the Gallup poll for this because it is such a simple, straightforward question that they put to people. There are other reasons I like the Gallup poll for this purpose, but um, they just simply ask people, do you approve or disapprove of the way that President Blank, whoever president the president is at the time, do you approve or disapprove of the way that the president is handling his job? And people either say they approve or they disapprove. So the blue line that you see here is the percentage of people who say that they approve of the way that the president is handling his job. And I have broken it, you know, provided these breaks in the line. I bet you can guess why. All right. Anybody? Those are the different oh, questions. Well, yeah, that's that's when we go from one one presidency to the next, right? So the first the first period is Dwight Eisenhower, and then John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and so on, right? All the way down to the present, where we get uh, Joe Biden, right? So we don't have a whole lot of data yet on Biden. He's only been in office since January, and that means that really there's only Gallup poll data for February and March, right? At any rate. As you look at this trend line, anything jump out at you? Oh, that's good. That's that's usually not the one that people pick up on first, but we get to it. We sort of drag it out. But you got right to it. I think I heard you right. I think I heard you say that 
early over the 60 years or whatever it is, going back to the 1950s, president seemed, people seemed to be, indicate that they approved at a higher rate than later on. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Uh, 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 that's one of the things that I wanted you guys, Joanna, to, to pick up on, okay? And it's not immediately apparent. Um, so, you, you know, you got right to that one, okay? What's the, what's the second thing that is more apparent? Approval rating tends to be higher at the beginning. Yeah, that's the other thing. That I, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's exactly right, uh, Nate, that with each of these presidents, with one notable exception, okay, they end up at the end of their term with lower approval ratings than when they began. So, for example, you know, here with Eisenhower, obviously there are undulations for all of them up and down and so on, but if, if we just look at the beginning of the period of the presidency and the end of the presidency, they end up lower than they would, than they began. Some of them more conspicuously than others. Like for example, LBJ, right, starts off way up here near 80 percent. By the time he leaves office in January of 1969, he's down just under 50 percent, right? Um, look at Rich, obviously Richard Nixon, right, up here the beginning of his term, uh, up over 60%, leaves office, he's way down here around 20%, but of course he left in the wake of the Watergate scandal, right? Uh, uh, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, even Ronald Reagan, right? Ronald Reagan, you see, he, he's lower at the end of his second term than he was here. Um, George W. Bush, or excuse me, George H. W. Bush, the only exception really to this pattern is Bill Clinton, right? Because Bill Clinton begins in early 1993 um, in the mid 50s, okay? And he actually left office in early 2001 with approval ratings higher than any, any of these presidents. He actually went in the opposite direction. And that's in the wake of an impeachment, right? Remember Bill Clinton was impeached and the Monica Lewinsky scandal and you know so on, right? So that Bill Clinton's an interesting case as as this issue as with respect to these approval ratings, right? But you get back to the pattern with George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Trump's kind of interesting because Trump's approval ratings undulate over a much more narrow range than the rest, right? Trump. He, I don't think Trump ever really got up over 50%. So he was mainly between, for most of his presidency, he was in the 40s, all right? He dips down early in his term, down below to the mid-30s. And of course, he left office in January of this year. He was down around 34%, people saying that they approved the way that Trump handled his job. And I, I suspect that, you know, some of that has to do with, um, his refusal to concede the election, people probably kind of just many people, not his supporters, of course, his supporters were on fire for him, right? But many people, I think, just got to just concede the election, couldn't concede the election. And so, you know, people sort of uh, project that onto his job performance, I suspect. So anyway, we'll see what happens with Biden. But you can see that already, just with two data points, Biden has had a little bit of a drop off that is likely to go up and down just like all of these other presidents, but we'll see what it is at the end of his term, whether he's a one-term president or a two-term president, right? Okay, so anyway, that seems pretty, those are the two, those are the two trends that I wanted you to see, or two patterns I wanted you to see. Now, this other trend line that I had on the original graph, I tell you what, before I go to that, let me, let me just ask you to, speculate for me you know why do you think it is that you get this pattern let's start with the individual presidents why is it that you get again with the exception of clinton with each of these presidents you get a drop off over their term of office yeah adam because at first they say what the people want to hear but in the end they can't really like you know keep it with the Maybe I think that's a that's a pretty common. Um, pardon me for a moment. 
that's a pretty commonly held view is that you know politicians promise a lot and then they don't deliver and maybe that's why the opinion the opinion of their performance comes down i've seen studies though you might be surprised by how much historically over the period that we're talking about how much of a president's campaign agenda is actually enacted you might be surprised it's actually for many people a surprisingly high percentage of their agenda what they at least in some form that they say they're going to do x y and z and in some form they do x y and z but again as i've said many times probably in here at least a couple of times what happens in politics isn't so much about what actually happens it's about perception what people perceive so you might be right if what you want to say adam and, and i think maybe you are is that in the way people perceive things is that they don't deliver on their campaign promises whether they do or whether they don't is maybe not as important as whether people perceive that they do or they don't okay so if people perceive that they're not delivering on their campaign promises then we would probably expect that would result in some you know um uh, uh, mitigation of the of the approval ratings okay some adjusting of the of the approval there's also issues along the way that they can't handle that they couldn't prevent from happening and it's oh, hard. It's hard. It's hard. interesting okay so let, let's let's look at this all right let me put the present like yeah let me put this let me put this the, back up the all right, since you mentioned 9 11, let me just put that out here. Okay. So that little red arrow is pointing to about September of 2001. Based on just what you're looking at here, whatever you know or think you know or whatever, just set that aside for a moment and just look at the graph. What would you say was the impact? of the September 11th, 2001 events on the current president, George W. Bush's approval ratings. They spiked, right? Um, maybe not surprising, right? You might even have hypothesized that. Even if I, even if I had not shown you this, you might have, if I had said to you, hey, what effect, the immediate effect do you think that the 9-11 events had on George W. Bush's approval ratings? Some of you may have thought, oh, I bet his approval ratings went way, way up. And then I would have said, well, why? Why would that be the case? Why would the president's approval ratings go up as a result of an event like that? Well, many analysts argue that there's sort of a rally around the president, you know, uh, mentality. Right? People, their patriotic impulses kick in, and the president as the symbolic, you know, leader of our country, people rally around that. Certainly saw that with George W. Bush. Although you might also notice if you look at that graph that the decay effect is pretty dramatic for George W. Bush. It doesn't last very long. Those approval ratings start coming down pretty quickly. So that by the time we get, you know, here, he's back down under 60%. And even before the end of his first term, he's down around 50%. So the immediate effect, yeah, was to do that. How about this one? So yeah, Adam, I think you're onto something there, right? How about this one? This is, I marked this one here. Um, this says, Watergate cancer on the presidency speech. So let me just briefly tell you what that means. Um, when the revelations um, regarding the Watergate break-in, the break-in of the Watergate Hotel, and everything that... Um, was related uh, began to become public. Um, actually, there was a period of time where they were public, but most people were buying the administration's line that it was just a third-rate third rate burglary and that the White House didn't have anything to do with it. And so it really didn't have any impact, any discernible impact on the way that people perceived Richard Nixon whatsoever. But then more serious revelations began to come out what former Attorney General John Mitchell 
John Mitchell was the attorney general during the Nixon presidency, called the White House horrors and the abuses of executive authority in the Nixon White House began to become public. John Dean, who was special counsel to the president, oh no, he's White House counsel, um, goes into Nixon's office. And he was also, by the way, the guy who had kind of been orchestrating the cover-up of the Watergate break-in, the whole, the whole thing, trying to keep it quiet by paying people off. That's what the Nixon White House is doing. They were paying off these burglars to keep their mouth shut. Right? Um, Dean goes into the Oval Office and has a talk with Mr. Nixon where he says, very famously says, because, and we know because it was recorded, right? Very famously says there's a cancer growing on the presidency, very, very close to the presidency. And it's, so sometimes it's referred to as the cancer on the presidency speech, very, very famous uh, thing. But it's about that time, as I say, that the revelations are becoming public. And so what effect would you think that that would have all these revelations coming out about the abuses of the executive power into the Nixon White House, what effect would that have on Nixon's approval ratings? We would expect to see them come down, 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 and finally come down so much that Mr. Nixon decides, I should probably just resign. <laughs> so those two were pretty easy. Right? Those two kind of figuring out the relationship in those two examples are pretty easy, but you know, there's a lot of other events along the timeline. <laughs> We're not going to talk about all these, okay? You can just kind of look at it and maybe think about any one of these, you know, to just kind of speculate, okay, what would this event, what would the coronavirus pandemic likely be? What would the effect likely be on how people perceive Donald Trump handling his job as president? Depend, you know, given how it unfolded, right? What would likely be the effect of that? Or what would likely be the effect of, um, of, uh, pick one here that maybe you all have heard of. The, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it before or not, but the Camp Davis, Camp David peace accords that were negotiated by President Carter back in the late 1970s. Peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. That was big news. That's right, that's a big deal, right? What effect might that have had on Carter's approval ratings? Probably would look pretty good for Carter, right? But unfortunately for Carter, very shortly thereafter, you had the Iranian hostage crisis, which we know what the effects of the Iranian hostage crisis were for Mr. Carter politically, probably cost him his presidency, cost him a second term as president certainly one of the things that cost Mr. Carter, right? So anyway, you can speculate about any of these individual deals. The point is, and I think this is really what Adam was trying to get at, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, but I think he's trying to say, like, look, things happen along the way that are unanticipated. No president really can anticipate them, okay? Nobody can really plan for them. And depending on the nature, whether they're good or bad, it's going to have some effect on how people perceive the president's approval rating. So yeah, I think you're right on target with that. One explanation. Certainly that would be a good piece of the explanation for why you see these undulations, right? You see this up and down and up and down and up and down. Now, it's a little, no, it, it's not as satisfying as an explanation for the overall decline, right? It certainly is a good explanation for why you see the, you know, ups and downs and ups and downs. But why does, why do presidents end up lower than they begin? or more generally over the entire period, why have approval ratings for presidents at the beginning of the period been higher than at the end of the period? Well, that's a little bit more complicated, okay? So now let me go back to this uh, graph that I started with and I, I put off a couple of times. This uh, second trend line that you're seeing here shows the monthly unemployment rate in the United States over the same period of time. And while there are lots of ups and downs, lots of undulations, you can see that it is the, the uh, variability is a, a more narrow range than, than this line here, right? This is, presidential approval is varying from a low of about 
20% here, okay, uh, to a high of 90% here. So we're about 70 percentage points. That's a big range, right? Unemployment is varying over a, a much smaller range of about 3.5% at the beginning of the period here um, in the mid-1950s uh, to, and also again here, um, during the Trump administration, unemployment got to, at, at its lowest point got down to 3.5, right? But it also got to its highest point in the same presidency, right? During over this entire period, 14.8 percent, I believe, if I remember correctly, around last April, about a year ago, the unemployment rate was up around 14.8 percent. So that's a range of about what uh, nine or ten percentage or, or a ten or eleven percentage points range. This one is varying over a range of about seventy percent. This one over a range of about eleven, ten or eleven percentage points. So it doesn't. The undulations don't seem as dramatic okay, when you look at that. Okay, but let's just study on it for a minute. Really, what I want to ask you is, do you see any connection or any relationship? Just by eyeballing it, do you see any relation between these two? What What do you see, Joanna? There's a, a few instances where, uh, at the point where the approval ratings are at the lowest, the, the spikes. In so you said that there's a few points where when the yeah. approval rating is at its lowest, unemployment is at its highest. Okay, that's good. I'm glad. I think that's a good eye. Again, you picked up on something there that may not be that obvious, okay? Now, one of the reasons it's not that obvious is because they are varying over such dramatically different ranges, right? So making comparisons is hard. It's, um, it's kind of like, um, what would be a good, everybody loves sports metaphors, right? Let me try to think of a good sports metaphor. Um, it will, it will be like trying to compare the three-point shooting averages of basketball players where some are shooting from the college three-point line and some are shooting from the pro three-point line, maybe. Would that be a fair comparison? I don't know. I, it, maybe that's not a good comparison. <laughs> um, maybe shooting with different size basketballs. How's that? Would that make a difference to you, though? Like your a, a, a player's accuracy seems like it might. Don't you think? Wouldn't it mess up your shot? Like if like if I handed you a tennis ball and said, "Okay," and I get to shoot with a regular basketball, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't take that. <laughs> it might be hard. Okay. Well, anyway, um, um, data analysts have a way of of dealing with this problem. And I'm going to show you kind of a way that we can deal with this. Uh, how, is there, have any of you taken a um, statistics course? Anybody here taking a statistics course? Do you know if you have to take a statistics course as part of your education? So you'll take, you'll be taking one. Okay, anybody else? Oh uh, yeah, some of you are shaking your head. Yes. Okay. So one of the things that they're probably going to teach you to do, and it'll probably be a math department course. And I, I don't know exactly how the math department people approach this, but I suspect that one of the things that you'll learn in that introductory statistics course is how to compute z-scores. Come back and let me know, okay, when you take your statistics course. Hey, Fagan, yeah, we did. We looks like right out of the gate. The first thing we did in that course was compute z-scores. Anyway, um, a z-score is um, a, stand, a way to standardize the variables so that you can make comparisons, okay? And I'm not going to get into how you compute it. Okay, certainly not. That's not for us to do in here, although it might be fun, okay, for us to actually compute some z-scores together. But it has to do with the average, okay? So the average of the presidential approval variable is, I think, around 55%. Over that whole 70-year period, we take all that data. I have it here somewhere. Let me see if I can just verify that I know what I'm talking about here. Oops, wrong thing here. Uh, 
Oh uh, yeah, so the average presidential approval rating over that 70 year period is just under 54%, mid 50s. And the average of the unemployment is a little over five and a half or getting close to 6%. That 14.8% kind of um, had a big effect on that. At any rate, um, so you can see that the averages are very different of the comparing these two variables. Um, so what computing the z-scores does is it sets the average of both of those variables to um, zero, right? So this line right here, you can see is the average score. And if it's a normally distributed variable, you would expect roughly half of the data points to be above the line and roughly half to be below the line, right? For not only presidential approval, but also for unemployment, right? And then it also standardizes the, what we call the standard deviations, okay? So that you can see that most of the, for both unemployment and presidential approval, most of the data points are within, you know, two, per, two standard deviations. This is, one st this is one standard deviation above the average. This is two standard deviations above the average, right? This is one standard deviation below the average. This is two standard deviations below the average, okay? So you can see that most of the data points falls within the, that two standard deviation. So again, that's called standardizing the variable or computing the z-scores. Now, the comparisons are a little bit easier to make. So let's go back to Joanna's implied hypothesis. Uh, Joanna, she's thinking like a scientist here, like a political scientist particularly, right? And she's hypothesizing that there's some relationship between these variables. And she didn't say it exactly like this, but I think this is consistent with what she was saying. She can correct me if I get it wrong, what she was trying to say, that there seems to be an inverse relationship between these two variables. That term inverse means that they seem to be moving in opposite directions, right? Like the higher one is, the lower the other is, right? Or vice versa, okay? Now, let me ask you this. Um, what, in, when we do this kind of analysis, we oftentimes like to talk about the independent variable and the dependent variable, okay? Which of these two variables, presidential, approval, or unemployment, should we treat as the independent variable? I'm asking you to hypothesize a little bit here about this relationship, okay? So, what, what do we mean? What's the distinction between the independent variable and the dependent variable? One changes That's a good way to put it, okay? That observation changes in the observations on one variable result in changes, a certain kind of change in observations on the other variable, okay? So which one of these two, now you got to theorize a little bit, okay? Now I'm asking you to, when I say theorize, I mean explain, right? Which one of these two should we treat as the independent variable? And I'm just asking you to use your intuition here, okay? Presidential. The presidential uh, approval is what the independent. No, the presidential uh, approval uh, I think would be dependent on unemployment. Okay. On the yeah. All right. Several of your classmates here in the on-campus class are nodding their heads in agreement. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you, Nate, to have uh, to you know, again, theorize for us and explain why you think that's the case. Why is it reasonable for you to think that the unemployment rate is the independent variable and presidential approval is the dependent variable? Well, because what the president does has an influence on uh, the unemployment rate, theoretically. So if he has a higher approval rate, him, the people would, it seems that people would approve if he was doing things that would be better for the economy and the uh, and lowering the unemployment rate. Does that make sense? Am I it does. That's pretty good. So 
just let's back up a step though and make sure everybody's on the same page. And, and I think, as I said, I sort of just briefly said, use your intuition. Not asking you really to have any insight here to the way that, you know, a formal study might operate or anything. Just kind of use your intuition. Just ask yourself, is it reasonable to think that the unemployment rate changes as a result of changes in presidential approval? Or is it more reasonable to think that presidential approval ratings change as a result of changes in unemployment? And again, most of you who are having a reaction are saying it's the latter. It's more reasonable to think, as Nate suggested, that the president's approval rating is going to go up or down in response to changes in the unemployment rate. So that if the unemployment rate goes down, he theorizes that people are judging that the president must be doing his job well, and that's going to be reflected in the president's approval rating. If the unemployment rate goes up, people judge that maybe the president's not doing his job so well, and the approval ratings come down. Now, as you look at this graph, do, is that generally what we find, we're not doing any sort of uh, very sophisticated statistical na analysis of this data. We haven't even computed a correlation coefficient here. We're just eyeballing the data. We're just ocular examination of the data on a screen, right? What would you expect to find here when unemployment is low, historically low? Would it be above the? Would it be above this line or below this line? If unemployment is historically low, when I say historically, I mean just lower than average. If, I, if unemployment is lower than average, this is the average value for unemployment right here, zero. Okay? We know it's not really zero. We know it's 5.8%, but we've standardized the variables, right? So that both of them have an average of zero. Okay? So again, just to be clear, this is the average of unemployment. Okay? So if unemployment is low, is lower than average, that's when the red line is below here, right? It's on this part, right? Here, okay? And this is also the average of presidential approval. And if presidential approval is high, it's on this area up here, right? So what we're looking for then is areas where unemployment is below average, and presidential approval is above average, right? Do you generally find that to be the case? Here's a period right here. We have low unemployment here. We have high presidential approval here. We have um, we have high unemployment here. We have low presidential approval here, right? It is generally true over this 70-year trend that we find support just by looking at the data, not computing any sort of sophisticated statistics. You're just looking at the data and we find general support for this hypothesis, okay? Now, anytime we say that generally this is what we find, that means that there are going to be exceptions, right? After all, we're talking about human behavior here. We're not talking about a laboratory science where we can physically control and manipulate variables so that we get a more deterministic relationship, right? So there's likely to be at least a few exceptions to our general pattern here. So somebody point out an exception. I'm going to go down the trend line here, and you tell me where you find an exception to this hypothesis. Oh, here's one right here, right? In the mid to late 1960s, despite the fact that the economy was booming, we had low unemployment, from the mid-1960s to the late-1960s, you can see that President Lyndon Johnson's approval ratings are below average. In fact, they're declining dramatically, even as the unemployment rate is declining dramatically. Okay? And it makes one wonder, well, why do we have this exception to what we generally find? And I think that most historians and political scientists in this particular case would tell you, well, that's probably the effects of the Vietnam War lingering on Johnson's presidency. You see, as much as we can explain presidential 
approval and the public's perception of the presidency, presidential job performance in terms of the performance of the economy, and there is a lot of evidence to support that. That generally speaking, when people make an assessment about how well the president, well, whoever the president is at the time, how well this person is doing his job as president, it has a lot to do with how the economy is performing. So when the economy is doing really well, people judge that the president must be doing a great job. And when the, when the economy is doing poorly, and you understand the unemployment rate is only one indicator of economic performance. Unfortunately, the economists haven't developed a single variable indicator called performance of the economy. So we have to look at these in, you know, these indicator variables like unemployment. Another good one might be consumer confidence. We could look, we could put consumer confidence up here, and I bet we would have a very similar pattern. Okay? I use unemployment, I just like to use unemployment. Okay? So if people are saying, oh, the president is the fairly or unfairly, okay, correctly or incorrectly, it appears that the American people have somehow reached the conclusion that the president is the manager of the economy and therefore the overall economy, the macro economy. And therefore, if the economy is doing well, the president must do, be doing a good job. And if the economy is doing poorly, that must mean the president's doing a good job or, or doing a poor job. Right? Again, fairly or unfairly, valid or not valid. Right? That seems to be the conclusion that people have reached. So there's a lot of evidence to support that this is really a big part of the explanation, but it's not the complete explanation. So we know, for example, here with Lyndon Johnson, that even though the economy is doing well, oh, the American people should have been judging that the president's doing a great job. Oh, but unfortunately for Johnson, <laughs> who decided not to seek re-election in 1968, ultimately because he was doing so poorly in the public opinion polls. He was eligible to serve another term. He had served the last year and a half of the Kennedy presidency because Kennedy was assassinated, and then he was elected by a landslide in 1964 to a four-year term. He could have served another four years, but he decided not to run. Apparently, if we can believe what his aides say, because he was doing so poorly in the public approval ratings as a result of Vietnam. It's pretty clear that that's as a result of Vietnam. Okay, where's another period of exception? Here's one here. Okay, this would be in the 2000s when George W. Bush was president. And you can see that unemployment was below average here. Okay, but you can see a Bush's approval ratings come down, down, down. Any thoughts? What might be? Oh, another war. Okay. As the Vietnam War wore on, people judged that that must be Johnson's fault. And maybe as the Iraq War wore on, people began to judge, oh, that's Bush's fault. So we got two wars here that are thwarting our general pattern of the economy, but it doesn't just have to be wars, but right? it could be other factors. It's, it's unlikely that individual events, okay, um, I mean, the coronavirus certainly seems to have had a significant impact on not only President Trump's perception of President Trump's performance, but it also had a very significant impact on economic performance. And as we saw as a result of the coronavirus, the unemployment rate shoot up. Right? So, which, you know, is it, are people saying with Trump that they think he's, he's not doing a good job because of the coronavirus and the management of the coronavirus? Or is it because of the economic impacts that they're witnessing as a result of the coronavirus. Okay, questions about any of that? Again, the major point that I wanted to get across to you here is that when we talk about how people perceive how well the president is doing his job, it seems to be largely about the performance of the economy. Keeping in mind 
that there are all kinds of events that occur along the timeline that may mitigate the effects of the economy one way or the other. All right, questions, comments? Skip over all this here. Let's, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left here before the alarm goes off. We do need to reserve the time for the quiz. So let me just kind of show you where, where, go with it, where we're going to go with this on um, Tuesday of next week. Remember, we're carrying this topic on the presidency over to next week, right? So we started here with the discussion of the public expectations of the presidential of president's performance. And one of the trends that you all identified was that each president seems to have higher approval ratings at the beginning of his term. Now, analysts for many years have had a term for that. They used to refer to it, and I think even to some extent still do, refer to it as the honeymoon effect. It's a metaphor. I'm not sure how appropriate it is anymore. I think this metaphor probably had more meaning or more, you know, um, I, I think it probably was more appropriate in the past if we could go back to a period of time maybe where people didn't live together before they got married. Okay. Um, the idea here is that, you know, when two people get married and they begin living together, the expectations are pretty high early on in the marriage. But after they've lived together with one another for a while, they begin to see each other's faults, right? And the expectations come down, right? Sort of normalize. That euphoria wears off, right? Again, I don't know how appropriate that metaphor is anymore because, you know, so we've, our society has changed in that regard that a lot of people have that experience of getting to know each other now, li even living together now for a period of time before they get married, if they ever get married. Right? So you have to understand, like, this is a metaphor that comes from a bygone era, okay? But it still doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to the presidency, right? The argument here is that early in a president's term, when expectations are high, people give the president the benefit of the doubt. That's reflected in the president's approval rating. It's interesting to note that, I'm not going to put the graph back up there, but it's interesting to note that it must be the case that many of those presidents that we looked at had even people who did not vote for them were saying that they approved of the performance early in the presidency. None of those presidents had 80% of the vote, right, or 70% of the vote, or even in many cases 60% of the vote. So that must mean that even people who didn't vote for that candidate, once he became president, they were still saying that they approved of his performance early in the presidency. So there's this high level of expectation for the amount of good that this person can do now that he has become president. But then after a period of time, people begin to see the warts, perhaps the failures, the faults, whatever, and the period of euphoria wears off and the approval ratings come down, adjust downward as a consequence. That's what this metaphor suggests. What's interesting to me, though, I don't think there's any disputing that there is that honeymoon effect, although there's no, I can't give you a, an exact period of time for how long it lasts, because it's longer for some presidents, shorter for others. Some presidents, it seems to last maybe, you know, six months or maybe even longer. For others, it's pretty short. Like for Bill Clinton, it was very short. You know, I told you that Bill Clinton was the exception to the rule because he ended up higher than he was lower. Bill Clinton, here's another exception from, from the years that Bill Clinton was president. He had little or no honeymoon. Now, I think that was largely his own fault <laughs> because Clinton... I think, sunk himself in that regard from the very beginning. I'm going to share something with you here that probably seems like ancient history to you, but it seems like yesterday to me. When Bill Clinton first became president in January of 1993, one of his first acts as president, public declarations as president, actions was 
to announce that he planned to rescind the ban on service by gays and lesbians in the military. Now, many of you probably know that that, as, uh, that ban has been lifted, but that was by Congress about 10 years ago. Back in the 1990s, there was a huge backlash when Clinton made that announcement. And by the way, the announcement came from many quarters, including his own generals. There was a general, let me see if I can have this in here. I'll end on this point and then we'll continue. Yeah, here it is. This guy here, Major General Harold Campbell, the United States Air Force, actually lost his commission because he was going around giving speeches in which he was denouncing President Clinton, his commander in chief, as a gay loving, pot smoking, draft dodging, womanizing commander in chief. I always thought that was a hilarious combination. Gay loving and womanizing. That's what I said, Clinton, gay loving woman. So here's this guy. Imagine this guy. He's a career military officer, and he is so uh, upset by this announcement by President Clinton that he was going to lift the ban on service by gays and lesbians in the United States military that he was willing to risk his commission by going around and publicly denouncing his commander in chief. And not, he was. He did lose his commission. There was this huge backlash, and a big part of it came from within the military, but it came from other quarters as well. And so ultimately what happened was that President Clinton had to back off, and that's when that infamous don't ask, don't tell policy was developed. He realized he couldn't get away, politically he couldn't lift the ban, but it sort of morphed into this don't ask, don't tell policy which Congress, as I said, ultimately, a Republican-controlled Congress, ultimately in, I think, 2009 or something like that, uh, lifted that ban, uh, rescinded that ban. Okay, well, we're out of time, okay? But again, the point that I was trying to make was that some presidents have a longer honeymoon period and others have a relatively short. Trump, I don't know if Trump ever had one. Seems like Trump maybe never had a honeymoon period. Um, so he might be an exception in that regard as well. All right, we're, we're out of time. We'll see you on uh, Tuesday. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's what that was. Yeah, let's get that quiz in. Thanks. I almost forgot. All right, you ready? This is the Week 11 reading quiz. Oh, I got to do this real quick. Hold on. Sorry. I got to stop sharing the screen. See you next week. Okay.